Oh, hey guys. Hey, uh, hey Emily. <laughs> this is oh, our first God. live, by the way. <laughs> so I was, I was about to ask y'all that. It's a new adventure for us. Yes. <laughs> Oh my gosh, that's so exciting. Megan, I had mine with Megan yesterday and she was like, this is my first live. And uh, I was like, well, this is exciting. I'm exposing her to new technology. Yes. <laughs> I'm seeing if I can, okay, so hi, Jackie. People are able to like pin a question, but I don't know if I'm able to do that. Um, how, what have y'all been doing in quarantine? <laughs> working away. <laughs> uh, well, Whitney, you've been working. Yeah. Are you still going into the office? I have this week, but um, for the most part, working from home. Okay. That's, is that nice? Yeah, the office is, there's barely anybody there because of everything going on. So it's, it doesn't feel that um, unsafe, but <laughs> it's kind of nice to get out of, out of the apartment for a little bit. Yeah, I bet. I like, I don't know, I've been at my parents for three weeks, so I'm like, it's interesting, needless to say. Yeah, but, Casey's been at home too for about like the last three weeks. Oh my gosh. What's the most exciting thing y'all have done during quarantine? Probably mm -hmm. cooking. Yeah? <laughs> I feel like we haven't really been doing too many exciting things, <laughs> I feel like. We did, but, a, we did a puzzle. Yeah, we did a very impossible puzzle that we needed most <laughs> of it because I like don't have the patience to do puzzles. <laughs> but, um,. Cooking, I'm actually not a very good cook, but I'm like learning. Yeah. Cooking some things. Um, sleeping in Netflix. We watched Tiger King. We finished yeah. Tiger King the okay, other night. What do y'all think? I watched the first episode. Uh, and... It's, uh, <laughs> I would say it's like kind of not a great show, but it's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> it is definitely interesting, like knowing that that was that's like a true document documentary it's i know pretty crazy. See, i didn't i didn't know that and then i started watching it and i was like wait this is real life yes and nobody knew about it from like you know when it actually was going on yeah yeah that's crazy <laughs> mel what have you been cooking um i cooked some steak the other night okay ribeye that was pretty adventurous right. for me um we had gotten some salmon from Costco. We were gonna try, but it's like still been in the fridge because we haven't, we haven't felt like salmon. Even <laughs> we got it the other day. I get that. But um, Winnie made these awesome stuffed peppers the other night. So still have leftovers. So domestic. Y'all are so domestic. <laughs> you know, <laughs> quarantine brings out a lot of different things. Absolutely. Oh my gosh. Okay, so I wanted to start off with a game because Megan didn't get a game yesterday, but I thought it would be fun. And y'all can get to know each other better because y'all yeah. with each other that long. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, so it's this or that. So I'll say like two things and then you pick the one that you would enjoy more. And like some are tennis and cheesy and some are just cheesy. Um, <laughs> so, okay, the first one, pancakes or waffles? Pancakes. pancakes. Okay. Jogging or hiking? Ooh. Um, hiking? Probably hiking. Serena or Venus? Serena. And Venus. I, it was like a tie Venus. for me. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. like a tricky question. That's a tricky question. I know, it's tricky, it's tricky. Um, ice cream or cookies? cookies. Ice cream. <laughs> Football or basketball? Um, I don't basketball. really watch much of either. Really. <laughs> tennis, can you pick tennis? tennis? <laughs> Neither. Okay. Clay or heart? Heart. Clay. Better or Nadal? Better. Better. <laughs> All right. I would have chosen that too. Um, and then last one, serve or return? Serve. Return. <laughs> was Our game wrong. styles are a little bit different. Yeah. yeah. I'm yeah. sure you knew that. Okay. Yeah. I would have. I would have actually guessed that. And when he's gonna say serve out wide on the deuce. <laughs> oh yeah. That, you know, that, that little slice down the tea on the ass. Yes. It's terrible. <laughs> Um, okay, so kind of how it's going to work is I'll intro y'all. Um, a lot of people who are watching know who you are, but that's okay. I get to brag on you a little bit. And then um, I'll ask a couple of questions. Um, kind of the topics we want to cover is how y'all did inside tennis, playing competitive tennis, because you both were extremely high at your level. 
Um, Melanie, you playing professionally, and then Whitney, you playing in college, but both in juniors, you were at the top. Um, and then kind of talking about life after tennis. Uh, Melanie, I know you're still coaching, and then Whitney, I know you're still playing, but your day to day doesn't look like tennis. So, kind of going to go through that, and then if anyone has questions, we can add them on at the end, um, or if you want to talk about anything else. Does that sound good? Perfect. Sounds, Sounds good. good. All right, cool. Okay, so. First, this is Melanie and Whitney. Um, Melanie and Dan, she grew up in Atlanta, and so did Whitney. Melanie's a year older than me, and Whitney's a year younger than me, so that's exciting. Um, and Melanie played professional tennis, turned pro at 16, um, won the U.S. Open and Mix with Jack Sock in 2011. She was on the Fed Cup team from, I got this, 2009 to 2012. Did y'all win any of those years? No, we made finals twice, though. Oh, man. Still good. It was close. Good. I know. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then you retired two years ago and are, and is now coaching tennis in Atlanta. Yep. Um, cool. And then Whitney. Whitney um, played at UNC from 2012 to 2016. She won the national indoor championships with her team two years in her college time and was the finalist in NCAA championship with her team. They beat us that year in the late eight. <laughs> I'm not better. <laughs> um, and um, also won national indoors and doubles with her partner, Haley Carter, who is still playing professionally. Yep. Yeah. And doing pretty well in doubles right now, huh? Doing very well. Yeah. Holy crap. Sorry, Corona. Sorry, Haley. <laughs> um, but, and now you are in project management for yep. Atlanta. Yep. Cool. So, okay, just to start us off, I'll start us with a nice deep question. Um, but just what would you guys say, tennis has been a part of your whole entire life, but what does tennis mean for you? Go ahead. So I think for me, um, you know, growing up, I have two brothers that also play, as you know. Um, and I think for me, it was just kind of a way for all three of us to bond. And our dad was our coach as well. So, you know, it's kind of a family bonding thing. Um, and then not only that, I just feel like tennis teaches you a lot of life lessons. You know, it teaches you how to work hard and be mentally tough. And I think, you know, it's obviously a sport and it's fun and it's good to get some exercise. But I think it just brings a lot of really good things to your day-to-day -day life. Um, so for me, it's just, it's kind of a well-rounded Thing that you bring to your life and you know take what you what you can from it yeah yeah I, I totally agree I mean I think you know for me it's kind of funny because two sisters and so two brothers and we all play different levels of tennis so there, I just feel like there's so many different routes you can go you know I played pro my twin sister Catherine played college tennis my little sister Christina plays club tennis in college so I, I think it's it's just very cool like there's so many different ways to go and um, I feel like tennis really brings you joy and it's so fun to play. And in the individual sport, I, I, exactly like when you said, I feel like it really helps you develop as a person and become independent, especially at a younger age, um, which is very helpful, I feel like, in all aspects of life. Yeah, absolutely. I agree with you all. I think it's pretty cool that both of you have two siblings and both of them played tennis as well yeah. at a pretty high level. Um, both of Whitney's brothers played at Georgia Tech, and then Melanie said her sister Catherine um, played at Furman, and then it was just Bunny's birthday, right? Yeah, yesterday. Oh my gosh, how old is she now? She's 22. Can that's you that? Crazy. I know, I know. That's crazy. Um, so I think one thing that really stuck out to me, you know, both of you, even though Melanie, you were a year older, and Whitney, you were a year younger, were really um, role models for me growing up of being like, oh, what's Whitney doing? What's Melanie doing? Um, because y'all were so different in a sense of being set apart from the rest of the group. And I'm not even saying rankings, but it was just so tough to play against y'all. So what do you think, and maybe, you know, siblings had something to do with that with your competitiveness, um, but what do you think for you really set you apart from other people around your age? Um. You know, for me, I like knew I wanted to be a pro tennis player since I was nine years old. So for me, like that was the goal. Like I was gonna do everything possible to get there. And I knew for me, like luckily I had some good people around me that 
helped me understand at a young age how many good tennis players are out there. <laughs> and um, that sometimes I feel like we get stuck in like our little city or Georgia even and, you know, becoming number one in Georgia, like compared to the entire world, right, yeah. is like, unfortunately, like not that big of a deal, right? So I think for me, like I went to Australia when I was like 13 and to, and to just see so many good players and everyone has such a good forehand and backhand and start, you know, so it's like, what are you going to have that sets you apart from everybody else? And I think those are the players that really make it pro because obviously that's like the highest level and you have to have like something that sets you apart. So I think for me, like mentally was really my strong suit you know i think that's something that did set me apart like trying to do everything right having the work ethic having the dedication to the sport and um really like every day you know going in with the attitude to get better just to get a little bit better like every single day absolutely do you think that came from you naturally because your goal was to be a professional tennis player or do you think you really had coaches and maybe your parents as well who put you in environments early to say Hey, this is the path that it needs to look like um you know it's funny because one thing my parents always said in, in interviews and things like that that it they didn't have to wake me up in the morning you know to to get up and go running at 6 a.m like they didn't have to make me go to bed early or miss a party or dance or something that my friends went to it really came from me and i really do think that that's one of the reasons why I did make it yeah. was because it was coming from me that I wasn't being pushed from someone else. And so like, it made me really, really want it. And if I was gonna make it, it was gonna be for myself and not for anyone else. And unfortunately, I feel like there's a lot of people that want it for their kids or they want it for their player. And unless it comes from the player themselves, I mean, I feel like it's very, very difficult. Yeah, I completely agree with you with that. What about you, Whit? What yeah, do you think that um, part? I mean, I think kind of similar to Mel, it's the, you know, the mental side of it for me. I made that a very big priority, probably number one priority, you know, probably when I was 10 or 11. Um, I realized that, you know, if you have a bad attitude on the court, you're not going to play well. Yeah. If you have a bad attitude on the court, that's what people remember. And, you know, it's, I just feel like from an early age, I was like, I'm going to have the best attitude I can every single day, even though it's extremely hard sport and you know it's easy to be like having to have a bad day and you know let your <laughs> attitude kind of go down but um I feel like just having that in the back of my head every single time I stepped on the court that I was gonna have a good atti attitude no matter what I think that really helped me and like anything else the, the more you practice having a good attitude I feel like the you know somewhat easier it becomes um to kind of keep that up and continue it um so I'd say that's probably the one thing that, to me, that stuck out, um, that helped me kind of stand out from the crowd. Yeah. Um, and then also just the hard work. You know, you you gotta you gotta want it. You gotta you know be willing to put in an extra ten minutes here and there, an extra hour, you know, extra day of the week. Um, like Mel said, you know, you can't really tell someone they want something. You know, you you gotta you gotta want it for yourself. So I think yeah. that's that's what helps people stand out. Absolutely. What would you guys say? I, I think it's easy to talk about hard work and being mentally tough, but what do you? What would you say are tangible ways on the court that you did that? I often talk to my players about you know having a routine and making sure you go through that every time. But specifically for y'all, what were ways on the court that you goals you wanted or things you stuck to that really helped you stay mentally tough? Um. That's a tough one. <laughs> it's it's kind of not really a tangible thing. Um, I'd say for the hard work, though, I think sometimes, you know, even today, if I'm going for a run or something, it's like, okay, I'm going to set this small goal for myself, like, you know, go for an extra five minutes. And then when you get that to that goal, okay, do another five minutes. Um, it's just, I don't know, maybe sometimes it's just setting a little tiny goal and, you know, accomplishing that. And then, you know, next time make it a little bit harder. Um, you know, that way you're you're still working hard, but it doesn't it doesn't have to be. Oh, I have to put in four extra hours today. I think that's where some people get a little overwhelmed, where they're like, you know, I, I got to put in a certain number of you know hours or reps or whatever it is to be working hard. But I think sometimes it's just 
you know, a little bit here and there, and then quality also. Absolutely. What about you, Mel? Yeah, I, I totally agree. It's way more about the quality of the practice than the quantity. I mean, at the pro level, you know, you have everyone plays different amounts of tennis per day. You know, you, you kind of know what works for you, and some people like to practice four hours a day. Some people like to practice one hour a day. Some people like to practice 30 minutes and just feel <laughs> the ball and that's it, you know? Yep. It's just so funny, like everyone's so different. So I think it really just depends on what kind of style you have, what kind of player you are, like what really works for you. Um, but I like you're saying with, yeah, you're, especially with just this generation, like I feel like you're totally right. It's, it's kind of hard, you almost have to give them specific kind of goals to really really focus on or else like their mind is just all over the place so i i totally agree with you coaching these days can can be a little bit difficult i feel like yeah absolutely and i think i mean even just giving the simple routine of hey after you play a point you know yep. if a kid's really angry i just want you to go to your towel just do it after every point mm -hmm. and they're still not doing it and you're like okay <laughs> you actually want to get better um, I think that's huge what is something um, you feel like y'all did off the court that really helped you either made you tougher physically or um, you know maybe a fitness thing that still made you tougher mentally Whitney you were talking about oh just go an extra five minutes but what were some sacrifices y'all made putting extra time maybe in that that gave you an edge off the court um the track was like my worst nightmare. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I like hated it, but it made me so tough. That was the best shape I like, ever was in, was when I was running 400s on the track. And then um, also like, I think it really, really tests you like mentally. I feel like it works your whole body and then it's just like a mental thing because you're just running in a big circle and like over and over and over and I mean it was it was definitely one of my least favorite things to do but then obviously doing it and getting through it I think it made me tougher and the other thing for me actually is I used to do a ton of visual visual visualization yeah and I feel like nowadays like people don't do as much now um and I feel like a lot of kids have trouble doing it like actually doing it themselves and actually visualizing points and things like that um, that's something that used to help me a ton, and I, I think it really made a difference. I would almost play a whole match in my head, wow. like the night before, or points in my head before I'd play the match ahead of time, sit by myself, and just get focused, and I felt like it really, really made me ready. Yeah, would you do that before you were playing, you said before you are playing a match, whoever you were supposed to play next, you were scheduled to play against, you'd put them in your head and then play the points against them? Yeah, exactly. Every every match I did it. It was like a, it was a routine before the match. So I'd never played a match without without doing it. Yeah, that's awesome. What about you, Winnie? Off the court? Yeah. So um, Casey, Mike, and I almost every morning during the week would get up uh, a little bit early and do some kind of workout in our basement. We have an unfinished basement. We do like two thousand jump ropes or you know, some kind of workout at home just to kind of get the day going. And I feel like that was kind of our extra thing we would do. Um, How old were you when you started doing that? Uh, honestly, probably like 12, 11 or 12. Um, yeah. Or we'd go for a run. I mean, we used to we used to sometimes run to elementary school and our, our parents would drive our backpacks yeah. to, to the school. Um, <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> yeah, it was Michael's idea. He wanted to do it. My dad's like, well, yeah, sure. Why not? <laughs> um, My kid wants to run to school. I'll drive. The right. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Amazing. Yeah. That or, um, you know, a big thing that we did as, you know, as kids was before every single lesson we would have, if we were doing a lesson with another coach, we would kind of write down our goals for the lesson, what we wanted to work on. It wasn't, you know, making the coach figure it out. It was, you know, hey, here's something I want to work on. Obviously, you know, part of coach's job is to be like, here's what I think you need to work on. But as a player, you should take a little responsibility and say, hey, this is what I saw in my last few matches. This is what I'd like to work on. You know, can we carve out some time to do that? So every time we'd have a lesson, we'd get there early. We'd have some things we're ready to, you know, ready to work on. Um, and then after every lesson we would do, we would write down what we learned, you know, what we want to take from it, what we want to go work on otherwise out, outside of the lesson. And I think those kind of things are really important instead of just going out there in a practice or a lesson and kind of just you know, doing it and then forgetting about it. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, 
hope a ton of people heard that because I so often think when we're purposeful and going about something, we're going to get so much out of it. And I tell a lot of the juniors, I'm like, you're writing down notes in class. Why wouldn't you take notes, you know, after a lesson? Yeah. Uh, takes two seconds. Yeah. Um, but that's also something my dad told me growing up all the time. I still never did it. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, it, it's hard. I mean, you, you got to take the time to do it. And it's not always the most fun thing or the thing you want to do after yeah, especially if it's a hard lesson, but I think at the end of the day, it really helps. And same goes for matches, you know, writing down what you learned and what you did well or didn't do well. Absolutely. Okay, so this person just asked, how did both of y'all deal with pressure before and during matches? That's a great question. That is a great question. Um, it's not easy, let me tell you. It's definitely not easy. <laughs> um, there there can be a lot of pressure. I dealt with it a lot actually um and it's not easy you know you hear people in like the crowd like saying things and you try to block it out but it's not easy um you know but I, I think what I learned what really helped me was not looking at the past at all it was like completely the present each point was like a new point and if you really focused on like just the point ahead of you I felt like that really helped me instead of before when I really struggled with it. I was consistently looking at, oh, I used to make that shot or I used to be that person. And that was not very helpful at all. Yeah, absolutely. Do you feel like there was a time for you that it really clicked for you into staying present? Um, and how do you feel like you practice staying present in practice besides just being in a match? Um, I think... Um, after I'd done really well and then didn't do very well and then started doing well again, <laughs> it was kind of, it was, it was probably when I started doing well again, like, and it was especially in practice matches. I know it's not easy. A lot of people, I feel like a lot of kids always say, and, and I remember the juniors too, the people I'd play against, they were always like, well, this is never, this is not the same as a real match, you know? Like how no one, no one plays the same in practice or in matches or it's so diff, it's so difficult to, you know, pretend that it really is a real match. And I felt like that was something that I was pretty good at doing that helped me actually try to pretend that it was, do all my same routines, really act like it was a real match. And so I could actually practice some of the things that I was hoping to do in real tournaments. And I think that helped me with, with the pressure, like practicing how to overcome it. Absolutely. I think I think it's easy when you can say, hey, matches are just an extension of your practice. Right. Like, if the practice, someone's not taking it seriously, right. I don't think they're ever going to do it yeah. in a real match. Whitney, what about you? How did you feel like you handled pressure before and during matches? Yeah, I hate to say, you know, same as Mel, but kind of the same. You know, in some of my biggest matches, especially in college, I would just say, you know, it's just focus on the next point, next point. It's, you know, it's really all you can do. I mean, if you start thinking about, oh, like, I should have made that last shot, I should have done this, I should have done that, you can't do anything about it. So the best thing you can do for yourself is just think, like, you know, what am I going to do on this next point? Like, what shot do I want to end up hitting, you know? Um, like Mel said, you just got to stay in the present, and I think that kind of helps get rid of the pressure because you're not thinking all the negative thoughts. Um, but also as far as practice goes, I mean, I think if you're going to go out to a practice, obviously you should have some fun while you're playing tennis and practicing. <laughs> but if you're going to go out there and just kind of, yeah. <laughs> if you're just going to go out there and kind of mess around, I think it's kind of a waste of time because you lose a lot of learning opportunities and opportunities to grow. And if you don't take practice seriously, you're probably going to have a hard time facing those, you know, tough moments in a match because yeah. it's just not going to feel, it's going to feel completely different than practice. Absolutely. Um, I just... I I feel I like it's fantastic. I think the players who stay present more easily are, are going to get ahead. And I think that's the same in life. Like whatever we're, we're dealing with, um, our past can come back to bite us. So I think, I think that's fantastic. What, um, what would y'all say? We'll talk on a little lighter note. What, it, what was one of the highlights of your tennis careers and, and why was it such a highlight for you? Um, I mean, <laughs> I never thought I'd win a Grand Slam in mixed doubles, <laughs> let me tell you. Never in a million years thought that. Um, but that probably would be a big highlight because, you know, I mean, winning a Grand Slam in anything, like, I, I will take it, you know? <laughs> <laughs> but I did not think it would come mixed doubles. I, I 
wished it would be singles, but a slam is a slam, so. Yeah. Had you and Jack, had you and Jack, had you and Jack played together <laughs> a lot before you won the US Open? No, that was the first year we played together. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it was the first year, so it was, it was pretty funny. It was a pretty crazy experience. We were down match point, our first round match. Who were we you, like you ever playing against first round? We played um, these two. I think they're both dub like double specialists, doubles players, and we like won the first set, and then we lost seconds at like six one, in like so fast and we lost jack serve a couple times i'm like how is this possible you serve like 135 miles per hour like, how are you losing your serve so easily and then um we ended up we ended up winning 11 9 third set tiebreaker so wow. it was it was it was a battle but it was a very cool experience yeah That's awesome what about you what I mean, I, I don't know how I follow up a, a grand slam no. win but <laughs> yeah you can say that you can say um I would have to say my freshman year when uh, at UNC when our team won the indoor national title because it was the first team title national title for the the school you know in history um, the program um, and I was fortunate enough to be the one who got to clinch the deciding match at three all in a wow. ten, I mean a seven point tie break in the third set so like everything about it was you know huge pressure moment yeah. and just being able to you know win that last point and clinch it I think that was probably one of my most memorable memorable exp uh, experiences. <laughs> um, and that that particular Sorry, match was one where I kept saying, you know, next point, next point. Mm -hmm. um, that one definitely stands out for that that uh, theory. Yeah, and I was about to say, my dad just sent the laughing. Hi, Mr. Saber. I was about to say, what for you that was early in the season because it was national indoors. Had you? clinched a match earlier in the season at all because there was probably only you know a couple of matches so I can't remember during the you know regular matches but I think um either the semifinals or the quarterfinals of that same tournament I got to clinch another match okay. so that yeah. definitely helped with the the finals yeah. experience, especially but... <laughs> as a freshman I mean that's that's really cool um kind of talking about your college experience Whitney why did you choose UNC and what was your recruiting process like? So I was fortunate enough to visit probably 25 schools. Um, you know, most of them were when we were at a tournament, we'd go stop by a school. It wasn't always, you know, any kind of official visit um, or, you know, unofficial visit. But um, for me, it was a lot about Brian Calvis, who was my coach and he's, you know, the current coach. I think he just felt the most genuine and he created a really great culture at UNC. I mean, also the girls, I'm, obviously a lot of the girls on the team were not, you know, my actual teammates when I was visiting. Um, but just the kind of culture that he cultivated at UNC was what kind of brought me to the school. Um, you know, it was it was an up and coming program, you know, ranking wise and all that and results. Um, so that helped. But I think it was honestly just the kind of family feel that came with it. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, kind of switching into the transition of life after tennis, even though we're still all involved in tennis in some way, shape, or form. Um, Melanie, you've been out from playing competitively two years, and Whitney, it's been almost four years in May. Yeah, I played. But you played about, professional. Two months of professional. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you back down. But yeah, four years since I graduated. Okay. Well, how long since you stopped playing competitively? Probably three years, two, okay. two and a half, three, three, uh, three, three. <laughs> so how, how do you feel like that transition's been for y'all? Have you, have you had anyone who has helped you with that transition and, and what has been maybe the easiest part and what has been the hardest part? Um, it was definitely hard. It was definitely hard. I felt like I was having an identity crisis when it happened because honestly, like, that's all I really knew. Um, I had been a tennis player my whole life. And it's like, okay, what what do you do now? Um, but I had actually, I mean, I had worked with a sports psychologist before, like during my career also, but that is something that she actually, she really helped me. I feel like make that transition because I was really struggling with it. Um, and just kind of knowing like what's next 
and like who I was if I'm not a tennis player anymore yeah. and things like that. So it really helped like talking to someone and just kind of like going through some different um, things with someone that necessarily like hadn't known me all these years, you know, and seeing it from like a different side, obviously the professional side um, of sports psychology. So I, I felt like for me that that really helped. Yeah, I think I worked with a sports psychologist at Alabama um, and I have worked in some other ways after I graduated with them. And I just think it's so helpful. I, I don't think people need to be afraid of going to talk to with someone because, you know, who who is a third party who doesn't know you, who has seen different things and can help you with it. Um, right. And I, golly, if I could afford it, I'd go see one all the time <laughs> when I was growing up because I think you sometimes feel like, oh my gosh, I'm the only one who's experiencing this and I don't know how to get out of it where so many people have gone through the same process, you know, maybe not at a professional level or a college level, but they've gone through it right? and they know how to handle that. What about you, Winnie? Yeah, I'd say kind of the same. You you know, you play this sport for your whole life and then all of a sudden, you know, your, your last match comes and you're like, who am I? Like, what am I supposed to do now? Um, and I think for me, the hardest part, other than just, you know, trying to figure out what I like doing was just being motivated for for something. Um, I feel like, you know, growing up with tennis, you're, you're training for mm -hmm. your next tournament, your next match, um, you know, staying in shape, like working hard. And then when it's over, it's kind of like, well, I don't have anything to train for now. What am I yeah. supposed to do? Um, so I think for me, it's been a challenge to kind of find that next goal, that next, you know, event you want to you know work hard for whether it's you know um athletics or work or whatever it is um so i think it's just it takes time i think you gotta not mourn the sport um but you gotta accept that you know you lost something um and i think at first i didn't i didn't even want to pick up a racket because i was like well i'm not going to be training i'm not going to play as well as i was but then I got to the point where I was like, wow, I really, I really love tennis and I miss it and I don't know why I'm not playing. Um, <laughs> so I think once I started playing again, I, I definitely felt more myself um, just because, you know, tennis is a big part of who we are and I think uh, it's an important thing to continue. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so Melanie, you're coaching, Whitney, you're working. What do you think the biggest thing you're playing tennis um, has taught you that now you're bringing into a professional work life? <laughs> um, so I think that's the thing that people ask all the time. They're like, how does sport, how does a sport translate to, you know, the supposed real world? I think for me, I learned how to be competitive. I think that's important in the work world. You know, you don't have to be cutthroat competitive, but I think it's important to be competitive with your coworkers and kind of push each other. I think you learn how to work hard you learn how to, um, you know, make a schedule and stick to it. You know how to, if you played a sport for your whole life, you know how to have something you're working for this entire time. And like, you, you just know how to like see things through. Um, I think you learn how to be mentally tough, which is extremely important in the work world when you're working day in, day out. And, you know, it's not always going to be something you enjoy doing every single day. So I think it's really important to, um, just be able to have that toughness. Um, I think those are kind of the main things that I've taken away that from tennis that have helped in my work world. Yeah, I think you just listed like 20 things. So <laughs> your child wants to play a sport, let them. <laughs> exactly. Um, you know, I I think it only helps coaching. Uh, of course, I mean, you, you know, obviously. I think having the playing side kind of in your back pocket and you know I I know like what worked for me what didn't work for me what I liked what I didn't like and then obviously seeing like all of my peers and other players you know I obviously watched their practices or saw them with their coaches and being around some of the best coaches in the world you know um I just think like from the playing side like it's definitely a lot different coaching but I think there's some things that really really help and then once you get tons of experience on the coaching side when you have both I feel like you're you know gonna be a whole complete coach I guess Absolutely. You could say it. yeah yeah and kind of question for you about coaching um I was talking to Megan about this yesterday I feel like you have your player identity of how you mm -hmm. were as a player 
and then your coaching identity, which I think there's a lot of similarities. I noticed like the things I gravitated towards as a player, I try to teach in coaching, but also worked on my weaknesses as well. What do you feel like as a coach is one of the biggest things you're trying to teach your players or really um, work with your players on improving? Well, I'll tell you, one of the things I struggled with, especially when I first started coaching was I like wanted every kid to be like me. <laughs> and that's just not realistic. Like not every kid's going to have like super, super work ethic, right? Or like super focused or like, yep. you know, I mean, just when I say things one time, they're going to get it. Like that's just so unrealistic. And so that took a little bit of time for me to like really understand. I, I still do find myself gravitating towards kids that remind me a little bit of myself. Um, but it actually, I, I realized now, like it makes you a better coach when you're working with players that maybe aren't quite as athletic or understand things as quickly because it really makes you like dive deep and have to think harder and how to say things in a different way. Um, so I think that's probably been one of the one of the best things. It was tough in the beginning, but I think it's yeah. also making me a better coach from working with some younger kids, you know, 10 years old that maybe, you know, don't understand things the first time. And, and, and like I said, it, it definitely makes things a little bit tougher on me having <laughs> to say things over and over and over different ways. Yeah. Um, but it definitely it definitely makes me a better coach. Yeah, absolutely. I agree with that. It's easy to work with the kids who yes. work hard and have a good attitude and do extra work. Um, but I've noticed there's maybe one out of 50 of those. Right. So, you know, just just more of a reason for us to continue to help them. So let two, two last questions. And um, what is maybe one of your favorite tennis drills that you did growing up? or one that you do now, Melanie? And then what is your favorite quote? Okay, it's favorite drill. I love two-on-ones. Um, I felt like any kind of drill with you are playing against two people. I felt like if you can beat two people on the other side, you can probably beat one, or you have yeah, a very good chance of beating one. So any kind of movement, um, you know, the side to side, or even just playing straight up points against two people, I felt like for me, that really, really helped. Um, and then my favorite quote would probably be, um, most obstacles melt away when we make our minds up to walk boldly through them. Oh, who said that? I can't remember, I can't remember. <laughs> but I, I've, it's been like one of my favorites for a long time. I've never yeah. heard that. I really like that. I gotta write that down after. Okay. <laughs> Whitney, what about you? For me, I think my favorite drill of all time, it's not even a specific drill, um, but doubles drills at UNC. Mm -hmm. It was the, the one thing I look forward to every single day. Even on the weekends, I was like, I just want to play doubles drills. <laughs> um, there was one drill we did a lot. We called it, Brian called it uh, Grandma's House. And I'm not really quite sure why, but basically you'd have two people at the net, two people at the back, and you're trying to get from the back side to the front side. And uh, the way you would do it is by winning, I think, three points in a row or making the ball bounce on the net player's side, whether it's in front of them, if it's a lob, whatever it is. And it's just, it's nonstop because you got the whole team playing on one court and you're going back and forth and running around. And Brian feeds fast, and if you're not ready, like you're gonna lose a point. Yeah. Um, so that was definitely my favorite drill ever. Um, and then favorite quote, it's a Maya Angelou quote. It's um, people will forget what you said, people will forget what you did, but they'll never forget how you made them feel. And that's I think good. that's just always been my favorite quote. I don't, I don't know for how long, but a long time. That's awesome. Okay. Well, someone had a question. Let's see what it is. When you feel like at the ro you're at the rock bottom of your game, what do you tell yourself to bring yourself back up? Um, deep question. It is, it you is. hire a coach to tell you that you're awesome. <laughs> That's what you do. <laughs> okay. kind of. I mean, I think I feel like I actually did almost rock bottom in my career, so um, I can attest to this. Like. I think it's really about you knowing that you're like capable of 
playing at a certain level or, or whatever you're striving for. Um, and then I think it's really the belief in yourself that you can get back. I, I think that's one of the biggest things. Like I said, it's really up to you. People can tell you, um, you know, that you're going to do it and, and you're going to get there again. But if you don't really believe it yourself, I feel like it's very difficult. So I, I would say it's probably that, like, you have to keep working. It might take time, but patience and, and keep the work ethic up. And eventually I think things will turn around. Yeah, I completely agree. What about you, Whitney? Yeah, I also agree with all those points. And then for me, I feel like the times that I struggled the most um, were the times I, you know, would put in more hours. I, you know, I've mm -hmm. always felt better about myself when I knew I put in the time and I put in the practice and effort. Um, the times when I knew I kind of, you know, took the easy way out, maybe, uh, um, you know, didn't do those extra 10 minutes of whatever drills. Um, those are times where I think my game started slipping and, you know, it's easy. It's like a slipper, a very slippery, slippery slope. <laughs> Can't slippery even say it. Too. Yeah. Um, I feel like it's a slippery slope where, you know, you, you can be playing really well and then all of a sudden, you know, you kind of take your foot off the gas a little bit. And then it just kind of like slowly or quickly just goes downhill. Um, so I feel like you just you just gotta put in the time and you know do what you think you need to do to get back to you know feeling good. And for me, it was always just putting in a few extra minutes here and there. And you know if it's thirty minutes of cross courts, just do it, even if you don't if, even if you don't like it. Um, so I don't know. I guess for me, it was just putting in the time. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, y'all did great. I'm so thankful I got to talk with y'all and I learned so much. Um, so if people want to find you and follow you on Instagram, what's your handle? I think mine's WPKAY. <laughs> I don't know. Let me check. It Are is sure? that many. It's mine's, that. Just, <laughs> mine's just at Melanie Dan. Yeah, we're super creative. It's okay. Yeah. <laughs> no, but I'm really thankful for y'all, and I'm very, very, very thankful that I got to talk to y'all and learn with y'all. I hope people can watch this because I think um, across the board of seeing people play, you both were extremely consistent, mentally tough players, and that's I think it was so tough to to play against because people end up beating themselves because you're you don't give them a chance to be in it. Right. Um, and I and I hope uh, I know Melanie with you coaching. I mean, if any of your players get a glimpse of that, they're going to be so tough to beat. Um, so I appreciate y'all so much. Thank you so much for being on. And um, I hope y'all enjoy the rest of your quarantine. Yeah, we will. And thanks. Thanks, thanks for having us. You're welcome. You're welcome. <laughs> I'll talk to y'all soon. Okay. All right. Bye. 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 bye.